Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. May I please the court? Uh, may I reserve three minutes of rebuttal? Yes. <clears throat> Kevin Colbert on behalf of FM, the father, uh, in a dependency action. This is somewhat different than our usual. Um, we are appealing from a termination of supervision of right. this case. Right, after it was reversed from uh, the appeal of the termination of his parental rights. Correct. And, and to go back to that, yeah, this court reversed, uh, I believe, August or September last year. It went back before the trial court, and DCF filed a new termination of parental rights. Which the, they then voluntarily dismissed. It, I represented below, and the day before the trial certain, uh, March 1 of this last year, they voluntarily dismissed, which left it in a dependency posture. Um, what occurred next was a July 3 uh, JR hearing. Our, our uh, appeal is based on that and another order that was entered on July 8. The July 3rd, there was no notice to the father. He was unrepresented. He was not served in accordance with the rule and, and, and law. Uh, with his JR SSR three days prior, he was not given notice of the hearing and he was un, un, excuse me, unrepresented. The second uh, point of appeal is the July 8 order. I'm not sure how that came about. Uh, I'm not aware of any hearing. Um, the father, again, was not provided any notice, not a proposed order beforehand. And uh, once uh, he was aware of these two orders, he retained me. I filed motions for relief, stay, uh, set aside and vacate, rather, uh, as to both of them. Was there any evidence of a hearing transcript of the July 8th Proceeding? No, Your Honor. So and we don't really know no, we don't. what the, actually happened other than the entry of that order. All we have is in the, the one transcript, and it's in my brief, that the mother's attorney said, uh, yes, Your Honor, I did what you said. Um, I've drafted an order with those findings based on those documents, and that was all entered in the July 8th order. I'm not aware of any hearing, and in looking at the docket, it doesn't show a hearing either. Right. The only hearing between the March 1 uh, dismissal and the July 3 JR was the Guardian Midlitem's motion to withdraw, I believe, in May. Um, we argue that, uh, that this is a, a violation of due process. Well, he was not given his 10-day opportunity to file his objections either. And moreover, that 8257 requires 10 days. And what has occurred here was, even though the judge didn't sign it, it was rendered the same date that the general magistrate filed her report and recommendation. So there obviously wasn't a 10-day exception. And, and what's happened as a result, even though it's not a TPR, it is in effect a TPR because the judge terminated supervision but enforced a no-contact provision, right? That's correct. And we would argue that he should have the opportunity at the JR uh, to go back before this court, and she could still decide as she did, but he should be allowed the, the ability to defend and put on the evidence that because uh, we're saying that he completed his services in Louisiana, and that he had been paying child support. And in fact, it's complicated by the circumstance that there is, or at least you allege, that there is a live controversy still in Louisiana because the appellate court reversed the, the Louisiana trial court's prior order of dismissal. And, and to be clear, because I don't want to mislead this court, yes, what happened was, and this was complained of by the trial court below in their July 8 order, he went before uh, a Louisiana court and his counsel, he was represented. Right. His counsel did not advise him of the ongoing dependency court here. Right. That did go up on appeal. That was reversed. But the reason for reversal was that there as here, the judges were required to confer. Right. And that didn't occur. It has been sent back Because the statute and, requires that, right? Right, exactly. And so but I there is some threat of res judicata if this order remains in force as applied exactly. to the Louisiana proceeding. I, was, I would be certain that, uh, that the mother's attorney would go to Louisiana and say, hey, here's what occurred res judicata in Florida, and the right. father was going to have to live with that. What we're asking is this be reversed and remanded that, uh, the, for uh, a new JR SSR and for a hearing on the July 8 order, uh, the findings and, and there within. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, Carla Perkins for the department. We have a case here of a father who has chosen not to participate in the proceedings in Florida. Well, I, I don't think that that's a fair representation. I mean, you, you claim in your brief that he could have called someone to find out when the hearing was or checked the f court file to find out when the hearing was. 
But the, the law is very clear on that issue. You don't have to comb through the court file or make telephone calls to find out when hearings are going to be. You are required to be served, not just have notice, but to be served notice for this particular type of hearing. And it is undisputed that there was no service to him, no attempt to even serve him for this hearing. So, you know, him choosing not to be at a hearing, I think, is an unfair characterization of the record. The Department respectfully disagrees based on the problem here where if you look back to even this court's opinion when it reversed the default that the judge entered against him when he failed to appear or personally appear at the advisory when he did by phone, you will see that we actually had to resort to publication because when we kept trying to serve him in Louisiana. But that's that's water under the bridge. This was a new hearing but judge, which, re which required service. And regardless of whether he flaunted or, or made a mockery of the system, the system can't then make a mockery of itself. You have to serve. The and he is, was clearly not served. There was no notice to him for this hearing. But the problem is that nobody knows this man's address. He's never ever, I mean, since that well, time. He has, he has, he claims that he has a legal address. Well, the legal address a, was included in the TPR. And you could have attempted to serve him. But if you couldn't serve him at that address, then you'd have a good argument but that he, we attempted to serve him. We were unable to serve him, so we served him by publication or whatever measure you were going to take. But there was simply no attempt to do anything. Can I ask it a different way? What evidence is there that he was given notice of the July 3rd hearing? What evidence in the record is there that he was given actual notice of the July 3rd hearing? Of the July 3rd JRSSR? Yes. There is no actual notice sent to him because the fact is dating back to that ruling from this court reversing, he has never ever provided. He, you know, that transcript, if the court goes back to that transcript, you will see where we had problems. We went to an address for him that he had. He even told the case manager that that was his address, yet every time they went there to serve him, they hang said on, that that was not his address. Hang on just a second. I think you're misunderstanding my question. I'm not talking about acquiring jurisdiction over him. I'm talking about giving notice of a hearing. The July 3rd hearing did not require service of process. It required notice. So my question, to go back to it, what evidence is there that he was notified of the hearing that took place on July 3rd? Notice sent to the address listed in the TPR, the Louisiana address. Okay, but that's, this is what I'm is, trying to explain. No, I'm going to ask you to please answer my question. No, I answered it and said none. None. Because the problem Let's, is. Can I move on? The July 8th hearing or the entry of the July 8th order. What evidence is there that he was given notice that an order was going to be entered either upon a hearing or no hearing on July 8th? None, because the transcript also reflects that nobody knew an address for him. Nobody was clear. And the fact is, if you look at the transcript. Would you agree with me that his Louisiana address, when he was represented by counsel in the TPR, is listed in the TPR, that Louisiana address? Correct. But can I explain this to you? Because that is the same address that we tried to serve him at with a TPR petition, and we had to resort to publication well, back but then. But then you would have maybe had to the, resort to the publication. address problem. But you don't say because the last time we couldn't serve him there and had to resort to publication, we're just going to not even attempt to serve him anywhere or give him any notice in any way? Can I explain? The, law, the way the law works is... From yes, the time please of the dependency, explain to us how the law works. <laughs> the law works. Yes, no, well, do. in terms of dependency, Chapter 39, there's a, there's a judicial review that's held every six months. So from the time that that was reversed and then it was closed out, there have been judicial reviews where he's never, ever provided any new address. There was the whole argument before the court that nobody even knew if he was being represented. Nobody knew where to send anything to him. Well, would you agree that you could at least try to comply with the statute and the rule by sending the notice to his last known address? I agree with you. Someone who moves has an obligation to notify the court if they want to receive notice. I don't think you'll find any argument from this bench on that question. My question is, is there any evidence that you all sent notice of these hearings 
to his last known address? Any evidence? No. Nope. Okay. Would you agree that fundamental due process notions require that efforts be made to notify someone, at least at their last known address, before a hearing that adjudicates these kinds of rights? I would agree, except for the circumstances in this specific case. So tell me why he wasn't entitled to notice at his last known address. In this specific case, the problem is we've had, you know, and I hear the court saying, well, nobody has the obligation to go and look in a court record. But the problem is when you have an ongoing case, you have a lawyer in the past who then turns around Mr. Fosho in Louisiana who then tells the court, well, he no longer represents him. We try to serve at an address that turns around and he says, you know, people are there and they're saying this is not his address. We have no valid address. This, he's known about this case from the time of the inception of the case. Tell me he's, what evidence there is that he knew that a hearing was going to be held on July 3rd. What evidence there is that he actually knew that on July 3rd there would be a hearing. I have no evidence and I see no evidence the record that would have said that notice was sent to him. Let me ask you another question. On August 23rd, the court uh, entered the order terminating supervision. Is that right? Correct. Is, is there any evidence in the record that notice was sent to or received by him for that hearing date? I don't believe that was done either. Okay. And would you agree with me that the court entered an order adopting the GM's recommendation on the very same day that the GM submitted the report? I agree with that because you agree that that's a violation of the rule. I agree that's a violation of the rule, but if you look, at but, the you're, but you're essentially just arguing, hey, the rules don't apply to this case. No, judge. Yes, that's, that's exactly what you're arguing, judge. The problem here, this is the problem that the lower court has faced. Okay, if you look at the record from below, dating even back to the prior TPR, when he personally, when he appeared by phone. He didn't appear in person and the court cut him off without inquiring as this court required. Which is why we reversed it. Correct. Right. You know, if you look from even back then, this father, the cases involved his children, instead of him basically participating and showing the court that he was interested and concerned well, how, about how much being can he participate? How much can he par participate? The, he initially had these children, then the, because he was the victim of abuse. The children were taken from him and given to the mother. The mother then moved to Louisiana. He then moved to Louisiana so that he could have contact with his children, but all contact was severed by the court. So how much could he participate? He wasn't allowed to have any contact whatsoever with his children. And this order perpetuates that same order, no contact. So how can he participate? If you look... Other than move to Louisiana to be closer where he could have no contact. Well, I think he's originally from Louisiana. so I. But think he went he back is, there because that's where his children were sent. Well, they seem to have been in Miami for a short duration. So I'm not even sure how the whole thing generated in Miami because they seem to all be from Louisiana. But they did go back there and they've been back there for the last couple of years. I think the problem here and the problem the lower court has been facing with his father is, and even when she asked his counsel at the hearing, actually at the August 23rd hearing is when Mr. Colbert appeared for the father. And she asked, where is the father now? He said, in Virginia. And then when the discussion was about an address and Mr. Colbert was asked for the address, his response was something in Louisiana. So he did not even provide the court with the address. <clears throat> of course, by then the July 3rd and the July 8th orders had already been entered without notice to him. Here's, here's the problem. We see the common thread that appears to be frustrating the trial court below. All three of us have trial court experience. So we, it's, not like, it's not as if we uh, don't understand some of the frustrations that can occur when someone is obstreperous or refusing to participate. The question, but that's not the question. The question is, was he given notice so he could make the decision whether to participate or not? If, if there was evidence in the record that he had been given notice of the July 3rd and the July 8th order and been given the option and notice of 10 days to object, frankly, we wouldn't be here. The, the, the question isn't, is he obstreperous? The question isn't, is he not participating? The question is, is he being given notice? The, the most fundamental basic notion of due process. If he is given notice and decides not to appear, decides not to put on a case, decides not to participate, that is his affirmative choice. But he's been denied the opportunity to make that decision. 
I understand the court's position, but I have to respectfully disagree in the sense here where because this has been an ongoing case, yes. it's not like something that was just immediately cut off and it started again on so July So what are you 3rd. suggesting he should have done that he didn't do? You know, here's the thing. He, what are you suggesting he should have done he that he did not do? He could have contacted the department. Honestly, he could have contacted the department from way back when yep. and provided every single document as to any compliance. He could have maintained a conversation with the case, because they're all assigned case managers. Now I'm going to ask you, what did he fail to do that he was required by law to do? He failed to keep in contact with the case manager. And where's the requirement statutorily mandated? Well, well, when they do a case plan or when they're provided with services, it's through a case plan, and they, part of the case plan requirement is that they keep in contact with the case manager. And is the failure to do that, does the failure to do that excuse the state's requirement of notice of all hearings? I would not say that it excuses the requirement, but here is the problem. Then, then, why he, are, then why are we still discussing the issue of notice? Because if he had kept in contact, everyone would have been able to You're provide right. him with the appropriate the, notice. And in the best of all worlds, that's exactly what would happen, and you wouldn't need to send out notices, and there wouldn't need to be statutes that require it. But there's both a statute and a rule that requires it. I'll tell you what's interesting. If you look back when he was not present at the January 18th, 2013 JR hearing, which I supplemented with that order, he was not present there either. Where he they put the date of the next hearing at the bottom. They did. But he took no exception to anything contained in that order. And the fact is, because it, this has been something that has been ongoing. Was he given notice of that order? Was that order sent to him? Since he wasn't there, the rule requires that notice be given either noted at the bottom of the order or that it be served upon the party. Is there any evidence he was served with that? No. So, so it's probably unremarkable that he took no exception to it if he never got a copy of it. But if he had had a lawyer, would the lawyer not have been able to look in the court file? Well, those are great that? and interesting hypothetical questions, but not no, the situation we we're, have. We're just going in circles here. Let, let me ask you something, Ms. Perkins. How long have the parties been living in Louisiana now? They've been there, I believe, over two years. Over two years. Yes. Why is Florida still involved in this case? Why, why if there's a conference that's been required by the Louisiana Appellate Court, a conference that uh, would be required by law anyway, why have the judges not conferred on relinquished jurisdiction to Louisiana to handle all of these matters and vacate the Florida orders? Why can't that be done? Great question. Well, the termination of supervision has, has also included termination of jurisdiction. And if you look in my brief, I've cited the But the orders, the stay away orders remain. The no contact order is a yes. no contact order from the Florida court. What right. happens is he's now, if you, 390134, 09013, subsection 4 says orders pursuant to this chapter which affect placement of access to blah 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 can shall take precedence over other orders oh, However, I, I, I understand Ms. Perkins I understand and if I were sitting in the dependency court today as I have in the past as you know I would be asking what are we doing with this case let's vacate these orders relinquish jurisdiction to the Louisiana court where they can actually provide services while the parties are there why can that not be done what are we doing still arguing about this case? I have to agree on that point. I cannot disagree with that at all. So why, why, totally why shouldn't agree. we just uh, require that the conference be, be, be had as required by the, uh, what is it, the UCCJA? What is it? ICPC. Say again? ICPC, That one too. Okay. <laughs> why can't that conference not be had so that the Florida court can get this thing off of our dockets and let Louisiana handle it where the parties reside? The court did terminate jurisdiction, so they, he now under But there's got to be a complete vacation of all of the orders that are getting in the way of, of these parties getting involved in Louisiana. Because Judge Emos is correct. There's a rest judicata issue on the stay away or no contact order that may apply to the Louisiana court. It's got to be, it's got to be transferred over there in some kind of a clean form so they can begin handling this case properly. You know, he actually has been doing his services in, in Louisiana or someplace else other than Florida. So he's been doing everything there that he can actually provide to the court. Because he just wants to provide to the court here the documentation that he can provide there. Let's get out of the way. Right. Let's get out of the way. That's what I think you should do. Uh, and I think you can problem. do that yourself by going back to the trial court now and suggesting that we do that. That was the problem with the last case that resulted in a, in a reversal was because he tried to appear telephonically and the judge was unhappy with that. Yes. 
because he couldn't afford to, or whatever, allegedly couldn't afford to fly here for the hearing. You should go back over there today. I just lead him to put this on the calendar for a conference call. Terminate the, the, the vacate the stay away orders. Let Louisiana handle it. That's what you should do today. Or at the very least, you should take those initial steps. And if there's an agreement, uh, you could request this court to relinquish jurisdiction for a short period of time Agreed. to allow that to actually occur. Agreed. So that the case can go where it, it, it by all it, it appearances, should be. And I don't think you'll have any, any problem asking us otherwise, to do that. Otherwise, we're essentially going to do it for you. <laughs> And, and we'd certainly be willing to wait to give you all an opportunity well, to tell you. us whether you want to relinquish for that purpose. We will do the motion. Thank okay. you. Thank 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 you.